back to the rehearsals. <laughs> oh, the band keeps me busy with band, with gigs and parties and practices every weekend. There's something on. Then, next thing you know. <laughs> Yes! <laughs> Pregnant again! <laughs> Only this time I've organised it. <laughs> I've decided I'm not going to kill myself in a little depression house with no mod cons. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to get myself a proper house. So I purchase a house in Coldale for £6,000. £6,000, Lola? Jack Wright nearly has a fit. Oh. I don't know why he's so worried about it, because I'm the one that has to pay for the <laughs> mortgage. <laughs> he's the one who's got to sign for it, though, because women can't buy without a male guarantee. <laughs> we get the little house, and it's a beauty. It's an ancient weatherboard, 180 degrees of seascape on one side, 180 degrees of mountain escarpment on the other. And I get myself a new car, a Holden. Oh. And I drive myself to Turoji, where I am appointed deputy headmistress. And the car comes in handy when this one's born. The births are getting easier. <laughs> July the 6th, 1960. Aww. Isn't she cute? <laughs> She's lovely, but that aren't red cushions good enough anymore? <laughs> oh, I love all of them the same. No favourites at all. <laughs> <my shit. laughs> One day, a group of young women go off to Coldale to the snow for a trip to the, to the snow, and I park Noni at home, and I decide I'm going to go with them. Now, when I go with them, there's an interesting man who's the coach driver. <laughs> His name is Eric Lee of Chinese extraction. We are instantly attracted to each other. Oh. And we spend the whole weekend in each other's company. Oh. And we enjoy that immensely. <laughs> 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 So, Lola, I see you took your pessary cap with you. I didn't. I deliberately hit it just to test you out. <laughs> yeah. He's let me know he mistrusts me. All right, you give me the name, I'll play the game, and I go for it. Uh -huh. Jack and I meet up every Saturday at the Lord Wollongong pub. We enjoy each other's company and a couple of beers. And it's a really wonderful time that we have there. The relationship is platonic at first, and eventually it becomes becoming does and lasts for ten years. Oh. Now, this one day, I've got little Noni at home, and something very strange happens. Her right arm stiffens up and her eyes glaze over and she has this fit of giggling and so I take her off to the doctor. I get it to the doctor and he says that she's diabetic and epileptic and she's got to get taken up to North Sydney Mater Hospital so Jack's no use at all in this situation and it's Eric Lee that drives us up there. Get her up to the hospital and the doctor puts her on belladonna of all things when she comes back, she's half pie-eyed and constantly drunk all of the time, wandering around. Jack's absolutely useless. He lets her go out into the frost barefoot. And he even says he'll look after her on the weekends while I'm doing a bit of housework. And he lets her wander around on our back slope, which is a steep slope like this. And she's out there in a trance-like state. Well, I put up with this and his distrust of me for three months. 
And then this one day, 1963, he gets a car up to Sydney with a mate of his and I say to him, when you return, I won't be back. <laughs> and I'm not. I get all the kids, everything we own, furniture, clothes, I put them in the car and off we go to Wollongong. It's a strange thing. I give him access to the child. He sees her every second week. She goes up to his place. Once she even comes back with a fractured arm. But he's such a wonderful man. Everybody in the community loves him. And he's worked so hard for the community. Doesn't make sense. Eric Lee is now my escort. <laughs> oh, despite the fact he's married with a grown-up family. <laughs> he's a very talented coach driver. <laughs> Popular with men and women. Loves a drink. He can hold his grog too. And I discover by sneaking a peek in his wallet So please join in on this one. <laughs> they say that this bus trip's a beauty. and it's three stories at one end and it's one story at the other. In the third story, at the back of the wall, there's this big split in the brickwork and all the plaster's coming down. So this one day, I get all the kids, I take them downstairs and I put a class under the tree and I'm teaching them under the tree. Now, the principal isn't too happy about it. What's going on here, Lola? What are you doing with these kids outside? Well, there's no room inside. Lola, you've got to bring them inside this instant. No teacher is going up those stairs and no child is going up those stairs. Now, you can do what you like about it, but I'll stand up with the sledgehammer at the top of them. No one's going up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> what a hoo-ha! <laughs> the minister's called down, much to the horror of the principal. <gasps> He's just another bloke as, I'm, as far as I'm concerned. No back doors with me. Anyway, the minister comes down. He looks at what I'm doing. And in a moment, he has a team of experts down there. And they're all checking the core samples of the earth. And they quickly work out that the school has actually built, been built on a clay dike that is slipping. And if immediate remedial action isn't taken, the whole school will collapse. They all come in, they stabilise it, they fix it all up, and I don't get into too much trouble over that. <laughs> 1966, I've appointed Deputy Mistress of Oak Flats High. Oak Flats High is enormous. There's 900 kids. 400 of them are in the infants department. I tell my parents, Denise, and she says, Don't be a fool, Lola. You can do anything you want to do. Hmm. Well, I'll give it a go. Yeah. After
after the first year, and it's very difficult, I'm in a managerial position and a teaching position, but by the end of that year, I know all of those kids' names, the whole 400 of them. And they know me for who I am, and I can take the whole lot of them for one hour of singing. They never repeat a single song, and they love it. Davy Thompson, are you going to come out? Oh, I'm here, Miss. This is my favourite part. It's my favourite class. I love Miss. She's great. <laughs> Thanks, Davy. You'll be getting the gold star. Thank you, Miss. <laughs> Thank you, Miss. All right, the whole 400 of you. Hands in the air. You all know this one. Yes, very good. Here That's we go. very good, sir. Very good. Riding a horse, horsey, horsey, don't you stop. Just let your feet go pretty pop. Your tail goes swish and the wheels go round. Hit it up where I would go. Very good, but that's not the whole 400 of you. Now we will stay here until you're all doing it. I love this one. Horsey, horsey, don't you stop. Just let your feet go pretty pop. Tower goes swish and the wheels go round. Give it up where I went down. Oh, very good. Good boy, baby. Thank you, Miss. Do I get a gold star? Yeah, yeah. yeah you do. You, you, you can go now. Thank you, Miss. Thank you. Very good, baby. I have a singing school and so a happy one. Socially, life's pretty good as well. I decide to get myself a second-hand caravan and install it permanently at Lake Conjola. Ah, oh, the Conjola mob are great fun. We ski, I can never get my lead heavy bum out of the water. We fish, we pinch oysters, we drink beer. I've got my accordion and we sing the nights away. Oh, happy days. So much so that I am named King of the Kids. And it's great, except for the fact that old Eric Lee ends up dumping me in 1972 because he's sick of all the kids that I've got around me. It's just about driven him to distraction. And he is well by then into his 60s. Uh, he's kind, he's caring, he's affectionate. We've never had an argument in 10 years. And he's the first and only man to ever dump me, the bastard. <laughs> <laughs> then I have to spend six long months without an escort. <laughs> Until May 18th, 1973, I meet Bill Everland. I meet him at a workers' dance. We come across each other in a progressive barn dance. <laughs> you know how you say to people, good evening, how are you? I say, good evening, how are you? Any better love and I'd be dangerous. <laughs> That's how I like my men. <laughs> oh, yeah. And off I go to the next partner. The end of that night, Jack comes up to my table. He asks me out for a late supper. Of course, Mum comes along. And that's it. I fall in love with him. It's easy to fall in love with Jack. He's got a twinkle in his eye that he'll charm a sparrow out of a tree. <laughs> now, um, with Bill, with um, Jack Wright, I've been involved in coal miners, industrial problems, and all their personalities. But with Bill, I am thrown into the lives of seamen. <laughs> and painters and wharfies and dockers. <laughs> and we have.
have a wonderful relationship that develops very quickly in spite of the fact he's married with four kids. <laughs> Hope! Well, I give him a couple of years to think it over. <laughs> By 1975, I decide that's about enough time. So I help force him into the situation. <laughs> you see, I'm living in Wollongong which is halfway between his house and his home. So I think I'll move out of Wollongong and he might have to follow. So I have enough money to buy a new house in Oak Flats. Well, I've got enough for a deposit anyway. So I approach the Illawarra Building Society. Lola, I'm very sorry, but you're gonna need a male guarantor. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks, I'm very, there's nothing I can do. It's the bank policy, I'm afraid. I earn more money than any bloke I know. <laughs> now look, I'll give you 20 minutes. You go and talk to your bosses about this, but if you don't do business with me, I'm getting painters and warpies and dockers and painters all out on strike. I'll have all the unions behind me. Now you have got 20 minutes to make up your mind. Go! Oh! <laughs> I'll get the money for that house. <laughs> and I move into Oak Flats with Mum and Noni, but not Denise. Denise has gone to Canberra to become a nurse, and this is where she discovers what has happened to my son Peter and my brother Bill. It's Hunter's Syndrome. Women are the carriers of the disease. Men suffer from it. And funnily enough, it's Denise, the only one who doesn't want to marry and have kids, that is the only one of the girls who doesn't carry it. After about six months, Bill joins us in Oak Flats. Life is a dream. Busy, 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 busy. And this is where I joined the ALP. You see, Bill's got a mate, George Peterson. George Peterson gets in his ear. He's the Illawarra member for the Labor Party. And he says he wants more people in the Labor Party. And Bill says, well, I'll be in it. And so will Lola, whether Lola wants to or not. <laughs> and this is how I end up being secretary of the local branch. So... Off I go, and this is where I start to join in lots of demonstrations and protests. Wollongong people have always been great protesters and demonstrators. And on Friday nights, we all go down to the Oak Flats pub. Um, Bill's cronies come along, and so do my teacher mates and ALP people, and we all get there and we drink, and we always end up at my place. And this is where the keg nights begin. Someone procures a temp right. Bill gets a keg off one of the ships, duty free and cost free, I imagine. <laughs> Fell off the back of a ship. <laughs> People pour their own beer, put money in the donation box, the profits go to the Community Voice, which is a little left wing publication that we're running. And we have a wonderful time. There's plenty of room out the back for chairs and tables. Bill, can you put out some of those chairs and tables? I'd love um, to, Lola. Love to. I wheel out my organ, my musical organ, <laughs> and I stick it on the patio, which acts as a stage. And all night we sing and dance and carry on and people call out whatever they want. Some of them went, want pop songs. Some of them want filthies. Ah, sir, yes, I am looking at you and you are telling me with your eyes you would like to hear a filthy song right now. <laughs> you were saying All that right. just before. Are you saying that, Lola? If you insist. Let's have a filthy. Screwdriver 
True infant's mistress style, she makes sure nobody has an excuse for not singing. Even those of us who can't hold a tune, guilty, are obliged to bellow out the words at the top of their lungs. And that is why all of the people around the Illawarra know all of the words to the red flag and all of the words to solidarity forever. Why? Because of Lola's transparencies. Let's have a hand for Lola. Oh! its knees, I'm not allowed to pick it up and cuddle it. And if a kid deserves a good paddling, I'm not allowed to do that either. Not happy about that. <laughs> and Bill, he's not enjoying the Maritime Service Board either. You see, they're taking all this stuff that really pertains to Paul Kembler to Canberra. 
he doesn't like that. He's really grumpy about it. So I'll say to him one day, well, why don't we just leave all this behind? And I talk to a friend who's got a friend in Narandra and that friend says, Well, why don't you both come up to Narandra and uh, we'll buy the Grong Grong Club between the three of us, I reckon. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't actually happen because Bill's doing some sort of business <laughs> about it and it never eventuates but what does happen is the railway refreshment rooms comes up for sale and I think well here's this shot how about we purchase that and let them all stew in their own juices <laughs> so in 1981 we arrive in Narandra as the new proprietors of the RRR and I begin my new career as a barmaid we make a whole lot of new mates, butte friends, not least amongst them the Aboriginals, who reckon that we give them a better deal than anybody else in town. Now I'm working my finger to the bone, and Amy is getting a little bit difficult at 76. She says her eyesight's getting poor and she can't see grime or dust. She manages to see her way to the pub every day. <laughs> And she gets her free beer. And Bill christens her crime. She does not pay. <laughs> then, that's good, isn't it? In 1983, we decide we're going to get some land in Marunda. Now, Marunda's about 30 k's outside of Narandra. And we put a little shed on it. It's just a desert, really. And we call it our sacred acre and I realise I'm going to need a lot more money to put into it to make it a proper place to live in so I start to accept casual teaching jobs and I sell the Oak Flats house and I buy a kit home all Bill has to do is assemble it <laughs> <laughs> and in 1986 the trains stop running uh. And all the know-it-alls in Sydney say that we can't sell alcohol anymore because the grog licence stipulates trains and not buses. We're in debt up to our ears anyway. So I think let's just strip the RRR of everything we can get our hands on, get our curry mates in to help, and one day we're out at Marunda. <laughs> yep. And there we become part of the local Miranda community. Oh. In 1973, Bill asks me to marry him. And I say yes. And off we go to Coral. Now, unfortunately, Amy can't come because it's a very long drive. It'd be too much for her. I would have been just fine. <laughs> And it's the rock that we perish on because anger and resentment soon settle in. I wasn't even invited to the wedding. Would you do that to your own mother? No, of course you wouldn't. That's what happened to me. 1989, she's getting pretty difficult to handle. This one night, I'm doing everything for her, by the way. She's not guys. doing anything for me. <laughs> I invite her on every outing that she wants to be included on. She never takes me anywhere. <laughs> I cook, I clean, I don't know what else I can do. I do heaps around the house, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> then this one night, she has a row with Bill. Oh God, it's terrible. It goes on and on and on. And she demands I buy her a ticket to Queensland and she wants to go and live with Pearl. That's it. I've had enough. I demand that you buy me a ticket and I'm going to live with Pearl in Queensland. Off she goes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I've had with Bill, just him and me, in 18 years. <laughs> And I'm so pleased we enjoy each other's company to the exclusion of everybody else. Don't leave me. <laughs> <laughs> but then he gets diabetes and we have to give up smoking. He sticks with it. 
because he has to, I won't. Unfortunately, things aren't going too well for Queensland in, with Mum. And so I have to go and pick her up at the airport when she comes back to visit us. The deterioration in the old girl is a real shock. And I have never seen her so poorly dressed in all my life. <laughs> We have to put her into the nursing home. And then this one day I go to visit her in there and there's this big gash in her face and the doctor's by her bedside and he's stitching it up and I ask her what happened and she said she fell out of bed when she heard some voices calling her. Mm -hmm. Next week I go to visit her, she's sound asleep. So I think we'll just race off and do a little bit of shopping, which I don't have much time for these days. And then, when I get back, she's dead. Vale Amy, six years prior to her 89th birthday. We have a little graveside ceremony for her. Six months prior to her 89th birthday. Bill's health isn't that great either. It's getting dicier and dicier. But to celebrate our 25th anniversary of being together, lovely Noni gets us a holiday in Darling Harbour, Novotel. <laughs> <laughs> Tickets to my favourite musical, Showboat. <laughs> <laughs> Remember this one? He's just like Bill, an ordinary man. Hasn't got a thing that I can brag about. Now, Lola, it's a beautiful song, but doesn't have to have that bloody line in it. <laughs> Along came Bill. That's the name of the song. And there's a line in it. It doesn't have a thing I can brag about. <laughs> it drives him to distraction. You can see why. I think it's funny. <laughs> and we get back home and he's had bronchitis and diabetes, but his health really is taking a turn for the worse. And he ends up having a heart attack and he's airlifted to Sydney. When he gets to Sydney, the doctors are offering him an operation is to have a bypass, which scares the bejesus out of him. And the doctors say to him, look, you go and talk to Lola about it. So he does. My discussion is, if you don't have that operation, you'll die. If you die, I'm gonna spend the next 20 years of my life alone. Unless I find another one. <laughs> Quite frankly, I'd rather have you, but it's your choice. You do what you want. Lola, of course I'll have the operation, love. I used to dream that I'd discover the perfect lover one day I knew I'd recognize him if ever he came around my way I always used to fancy then he'd be one of those godlike kind of Not the kind that you would 
find in a statue and I can't explain it's surely not his brain that makes me thrill I love him because he's wonderful because he's just my bill. Then in 2002, he is starting to get rushed into hospital a bit more. By 2007, he's too weak to peel a mango. He's starting to lose his memory. He's having aberrations of his mind. This one night we're lying in bed and he sees a picture of himself up on the wall and he says... Who's that bastard up on the wall, Lola? What's he doing in here? He doesn't talk to me a lot. I start writing a dozen manuscripts full of 600 songs that I've actually recorded from music I've heard over the years. And the rest of that year is... Then in 2008, I get this call from the hospital. I've got to call all of his relatives immediately, all the immediate family. And they come in and it's not looking good. November the 25th, I get a call. Come in straight away. I do. By the time I get there, he's on morphine and his breath sounds like a death rattle. The doctor tells him, you're going to die. When he breathes his last, I close his eyes for him. He's just my bill, an ordinary man. He hasn't got a thing that I can brag about. And yet to me, upon his knee, so comfy and roomy, feels natural. And I can't explain It's really not his brain That makes me thrill I love him Because he's week it's the funeral. So many people turn up. Stacks. I can hardly see anyone's faces. I'm just in a daze. And there's a wake at the pub. And then we all go back to my place. <laughs> <laughs> But it continues on all night. Then the morning comes, the crowd departs, and the rot sets in. I'm devastated, but never in company. And I continue with my weeping life. Then I decide I'm going to read my diaries for 2007 and 2008. And I do. And I think, job well done. 
Nobody could have done more than I did for Bill. The changing it's of showers and dressings and undressings and medications and pad changings and all of the yard work, the chopping of the wood. I'm glad he died. He put on such a brave face. And if he wouldn't have died, I would have. God bless him. My friends at this time are so kind and considerate. But I'm organised. I'm independent. I'm healthy. And I look after myself too. Then I have my 85th birthday party. Lots of people come. And I give myself a present. I decide I'm going to resign from teaching, from um, giving piano at the nursing home. I've been playing there for 25 years. So I retire from that. And then in 2011, I am awarded citizen of the Urana Shire. Congratulations, Lola. Thank you. The smallest shire in New South Wales. <laughs> but I'm proud of it nonetheless. And then in 2012, a book comes out from Coldale Primary School and it's celebrating the 100th anniversary and a little boy who I taught 60 years ago writes in it. When in third class, a teacher, Mrs. Troy, came to our school, Lola Troy later married Jack Wright, icon of the Coldale community. Jack Wright gets a big write up in the book of, I don't think he even set foot inside the place. <laughs> Lola, as I affectionately called her, was an incredible teacher. She introduced me to a love of learning. She taught me so much about our country and some of its culture. She became an inspiration to me for the way that she radiated warmth and responsiveness to us kids. I'm thrilled. <laughs> <sighs> Mates of mine younger than I are still dying. I've got a list of them. <coughs> but life goes on. Happily and humdrum. I decide I'm going to take the autumn of my life day at a time. I don't think there'll be too much excitement from here on in. However, to reiterate an old adage of mine, I wouldn't be dead for quids. <laughs> and if I had to do it all over again, I would do it all over again, only harder. Yeah.
joking and wishes us all big love tonight. to invite onto the stage the real live Lola Wright. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you all know this one, the words are on the screen. Let's join in with L Lola, with me. When the union's inspiration through the work is blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet the force on earth is weaker than the people's strength of one, but the union makes us strong. Big round of applause for Lola Wright. Yeah. 